Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our very first in-person event since March 2020. <laughs> We're so excited to have all of you here, both in the room and for everyone who's tuning in online. For a window into the life of an astrophysicist, a live panel discussion that is part of McGill's Bicentennial Space Week. So I'm your moderator, Carolina cruz Vinacha. I'm the coordinator for the McGill Space Institute and also a member of Astro McGill, which is our education and public outreach branch. Um, a few reminders before we start. Um, MSI and Astro McGill are committed to EDI, to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and we can only share Astro awesomeness if everyone feels safe and welcome. Uh, so if anyone has any concerns or is feeling uncomfortable, feel free to email the, um, the address up here on the screen. And I will ask all of you to please take a moment to, be fam to become familiar with our code of conduct and the behavior that is and is that is expected and is, and is considered unacceptable. So, you know, treat everyone with kindness, respect and consideration. All communication should be appropriate for a professional audience. If you feel or see something that makes you feel uncomfortable, please contact a volunteer. Uh, so we have Garrett up here uh, and Simo will, jo will join us in a second. And if you see any unacceptable behavior, again, feel free to contact either of them. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we're gonna go ahead and start. First of all, the, the way that this is going to work is that this is an interactive panel. So we really want questions from the audience and we will be taking questions from you live. Uh, for those of you joining us in person, we've passed out pen and paper. Um, so if you have a question, just like write it down and raise your hand and one of our volunteers will come and pick it up and they'll, and they'll pass it on to us. For those of you joining us on, like on YouTube, feel free to type your questions in the chat and they will be passed on to me. So. Now it's time to meet our panelists. So today's panelists are three of our MSI graduate students. Uh, first off, we have Larry Herman, a PhD student in the Department of Physics at McGill University and the MSI. He works with Professor Cynthia Chang. Prior to pursuing a PhD at McGill, Larry was a test pilot in the US Navy, flying everything from the Gulfstream G100 Bizjet to the FA-18 Hornet, the newest P-8A Poseidon patrol planes. That's cool. <laughs> uh, here at McGill, Larry uses the aviation experience he gained as a test pilot to develop a drone mounted system to beam map and calibrate antennas for radio telescopes. The drone work is part of a larger effort where he works on the Albatross project with the ultimate goal of making 21 centimeter measurements to probe the dark ages period of the early universe. Next up, we have McLean Rubel, who is a PhD student in the Department of Physics at McGill and also a member of the South Pole Telescope Collaboration and of MSI. <laughs> uh, before becoming a physicist, she was a bartender at a burlesque club. She now works primarily on instrumentation for microwave cosmology, meaning she spends most of her time developing new technology to see very old things. Uh, and as a last minute addition to the panel, we have Nicole Ford, a new MSc student in the Department of Physics at McGill working with Professor, Professor Daryl Haggard to study the most massive objects in the universe, black holes and neutron stars. She uses telescopes to hunt for electromagnetic signatures coming from the mergers of black holes and neutron stars. As an undergrad, Nicole majored in both fine arts and astrophysics, and she's always finding ways to bridge the arts and sciences. So we have, we've prepared a couple of questions for them, and then you can start writing down your own questions. So first off, and I'll go in the same order. Uh, so Larry, do you wanna tell us a bit about your current research? Um, yep, so <clears throat> I work on that Albatross project um, that you mentioned, um, which is designed, right now we're just trying to take the first steps and characterize foregrounds and ultimately you know, make 21 centimeter measurements um, for the dark ages, but that's a little ways off. And also for the drone mounted system. Um, so I work on that. Um, the idea is to fly the drone over one of our radio telescopes and beam map those antennas in real 3D space. Um, and so we are working on getting that up and running, but it's coming along. What's 21 centimeters? Uh, 21 centimeters, just using, a, <clears throat> using an, an emission of neutral hydrogen to, to look at a period of the universe before there are any stars. That's cool. Okay, McLean, same question for you. What's your current research? Uh, so, I, <laughs> as mentioned, I look at very old things, uh, but more specifically, I build technology to do this. So I spend most of my time uh, designing circuits and uh, testing them, and <laughs> these are for op the operation of cryogenic detectors, uh, which 
is it the top left panel on the slide up there, <laughs> uh, for the South Pole Telescope, which is a microwave telescope. So uh, that's a slightly shorter wavelength type of light than what Larry works with, but not a whole lot. So we use different technology, uh, and we go to different places to build our telescopes, but similar type of instrumentation. Uh, uh, the telescope in question, the South Pole Telescope, is at the South Pole, so it's very imaginatively named. Uh, it looks very, as far back as we can see into the early universe uh, at the cosmic microwave background, which is uh, radiation left over from the earliest days of our universe. Yeah. Uh, Nicole, what about you? Yeah, so um, hi everyone. Uh, like Carolina briefly mentioned, I study black holes and neutron stars, which are the most massive objects in the universe, at least that we know of, um, particularly black holes. They are insanely massive and energetic. Um, we call them high energy astrophysics. That's like the category of research that I'm in. Uh, none of the pictures on this slide are actually uh, demonstrating my current research because I'm, I'm new, I'm a new master's student. Um, but yeah, I am now starting to get into research and so I'm using um, in particular the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope located in Hawaii um, to look for uh, light coming from when black holes or neutron stars come together and merge and just really is a big explosion. Um, so we're trying to look for light coming from that and we also get this really cool gravitational wave detection when something like that happens. So we're, we're trying to match up gravitational waves and photons so that we can learn more about um, the sources behind these mergers and uh, just learn more about the, the high energy physics in general. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Uh, okay, so our next question is, what got you interested in astrophysics? Or, you know, how did you end up here? Who wants to start? Let's go the other way around, Nicole. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, we can also put my slide back up if, if you possible. Want to put it back? Yeah, okay. So um, what got me interested in astrophysics? I've honestly loved it since I was little. Um, my mom was a physicist. She's no longer a physicist, but she was uh, when I was younger. And my dad has been an amateur astronomer. And uh, I think at the very bottom of my slide, it says I grew up in Hawaii. And so this is one of the best places to view the night sky in the world. And so I think I've always been a bit spoiled in terms of being able to just look up at the night sky and it just being uh, blown away by how beautiful it is. Um, so that's definitely influenced me. And I've also just always, um, I think I've always enjoyed the idea of just being able to explore the unknown of the cosmos. You know, I guess if anyone's watched Carl Sagan's stuff, I mean, it's very inspirational. So I grew up with that. And uh, just the idea of being able to, to try and answer some of these like very big unanswered questions about space and like black holes are just, just the most extreme physics we can think of um, has been really appealing to me my, my whole life, really. Um, yeah, and actually the, the top right picture is me in Hawaii, um, in case it wasn't clear. <laughs> and the bottom left picture, I was also in Hawaii, but that was for, um, I was doing an art, art space project for that. Um, so yeah. That's super cool. That Space project looks awesome. Yeah, thank you. I was, yeah. I was painting a, I think it was a stellar nursery, so it was a little spot where like stars are born inside um, gas clouds. Great. So McLean, what got you interested in astrophysics? Um, I feel like my path is slightly less noble than <laughs> Nicole. Uh, I was really into Star Wars as a child, and I took that to the next level in high school when I uh, joined and ran a educational space simulation program for four years, um, and continued my love of sci-fi in general. That uh, sort of blended the sci-fi into actual science, and so I learned a lot about space science through that and science in general, and then followed the pursued that into undergrad and then into grad school finally. So living the dream now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, Larry, what about you? Yep, so um, <clears throat> for me, I did my undergrad and my master's in physics and I always kind of wanted to come back and finish the rest of the path to um, PhD. Um, but first I was a Navy pilot and test pilot for 12 years. And um, becoming a Navy test pilot, um, military you know, flight test is very connected to the space program. Um, all the early astronauts, Gemini, Mercury, Apollo, um, they were all selected from, you know, Navy and Air Force um, test pilots. And you still learn a lot about that at test pilot school. You do a couple flights where you fly a small jet called the T-38 and you simulate coming down on the space shuttle. So you have to manage your drag and your glide ratio and all that kind of thing. So it's all very connected to, you know, spacey stuff. So once I was done doing that, I was kind of pushed this direction. Nice. 
Um, okay, so uh, one more question from us for the three of you. So what is your favorite and least favorite thing about being an astrophysicist? Let's randomize it. McLean, you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, which first? Which one? Do you want to start with least favorite and then favorite? Sure. <laughs> From negative <laughs> to positive. Um, least favorite, I guess. Mm. I mean, it's pretty good, actually. But <laughs> I think you have to really like the, doing this if you do it, because it does eat up a lot of your time. So maybe that's the negative, that it can be uh, pretty all-consuming. And some of that is there's a positive in there, too, because like we're here be because we love it. But uh, yeah, you can, you can lose track of other balance in your life easily, <laughs> for sure. Um, good thing? Well, I mean, that as said, that is both a good and a bad. I guess other highlights, um, there are cool travel opportunities, I will say, uh, <laughs> which is excellent. You get to go to places you wouldn't necessarily go to, especially for uh, observational stuff. Um, yeah, and spending all your time like asking questions and figuring out how to answer them is a definite plus. So a quick follow-up to that, McLean. What's the coolest place you've traveled? I mean, obviously the South Pole. It's definitely hands down the coolest thing I've done. It's also the coldest thing I've done, but <laughs> yeah, but not at the South Pole. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, so Larry, same question for you. Favorite and least favorite? Yeah, I think my favorite would just be kind of the day-to-day. -day. Like, as a PhD researcher, I come into the lab every day and just talk to, you know, other researchers about science stuff that we're doing and how to solve problems with whatever equipment we're working on. And I mean it's kind of nice to be able to come in and have that environment every day where you're just talking about things that are actually interesting. And for negative, I mean, it's kind of hard to find a negative about um, being a PhD student at McGill. Um, sometimes when you're doing field work, the hours get weird, like you'll have to wake up at three in the morning to check on an antenna. But even that's not really a negative because it's still a cool experience. So I don't know. <laughs> I admire your positivity there. <laughs> uh, Nicole, what about you? Um, Least favorite thing for me is more of a general physics thing than like astronomy or astrophysics specifically, but I feel like physics tends to attract people that think they are like almost godlike in terms of their ability to do math and science. And so you kind of have to, you're going to encounter people like that when you go into this field and you have to just sort of get used to it and um, I guess figure out how to, how to uh, check your own ego and, and be humble and, you know, we're just doing math. <laughs> we're, we're also human beings. Um, so, so yeah, and, and also just um, I think a lot of physicists think they don't need to have social skills because they're just doing math all the time or something like that. Um, so, so it can be difficult to interact with other physicists sometimes, I'll say. Uh, but, yeah, the positive, and these, these guys are wonderful. <laughs> they have social skills, yay. <laughs> um, and in terms of my favorite thing, I guess I've already sort of hinted at it, but I just, I, I think that the night sky is amazing, and so being able to, like, to, to put in some controls and like tell a telescope to point somewhere in the night sky and then receive light from that telescope and then like go and analyze it and like learn something about the universe is just super, super exciting. And um, I'm an observational astronomer, so, so for someone who does theory, they might have a different reason they love it, but that's for observational astronomy, that's my, that's my favorite thing. Great, thanks. Uh, so now we're moving on to questions from the audience. So as we said, if you are in person in the room and you have a question, uh, raise your hand and one of our volunteers will go get it. Um, and if you're online, type it into the YouTube chat. So we've already received a couple of questions. I'm going to start with those and then go to the ones in the room. Um, so our first question, which I think is from the YouTube chat. Uh, so. Related to what we were just talking about, what or who in your life triggered your decision to become an astrophysicist, if there is a particular person or event? Should we each answer, or do you think maybe? Uh, so the way we're going to do this is you can either each answer or just jump in and answer if you want. Like, not every person might answer every question, but up to you. So who wants to take this one first? I, I guess I can contribute. <laughs> Go ahead, McLean. Free to discuss as well. <laughs> um, I don't know if I had a particular like person or specific moment. Uh, as mentioned, I worked as a bartender for a long time <laughs> before becoming a full-time physicist. So there was definitely a transition <laughs> from one to the other. I do know when I 
uh, originally decided to stay in physics was partly the, being given the opportunity to do so. Working part-time or full-time during uh, undergrad meant that I didn't have the greatest grades and didn't have a lot of hope of getting into grad school, but I, was, uh, I managed to convince a former professor of mine to take me on as an undergrad research assistant, uh, which was the first time I realized I might have a chance at staying in the field, which, uh, I, to my surprise, made me so happy. I was like, oh, I guess maybe this is what I want to do, and so I'm still here. <laughs> Yeah, I have kind of the same sort of answer. Um, it wasn't really one particular person that ever really pushed me towards. Just something I always kind of wanted to do. And so when the opportunity arose, I kind of jumped at it. Yeah, for me, it was just um, probably my mom because uh, she was a physicist when I was growing up. So she always encouraged me to be interested in that. Um. Nice. Um, OK, so we have another question from the audience. Um, this is a fun one. So after doing so much research about space, what do you view it as? Is it still a spooky, mysterious void for you, or does it feel more and more familiar? I love that question. It's very spooky. <laughs> <laughs> Even potentially more spooky once you learn more about it. <laughs> Honestly, that's true. We have no idea what's up there. <laughs> Wait, so the more we study it, the spookier it becomes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, nobody knows what's out there. I mean, if we had it all figured out, we wouldn't be here working on it, so. <laughs> Yeah, not to mention the whole dark matter and dark energy thing where 98, 98, is it 98? It's a 94%, like large percentage of what is out there. We have no idea. And so as it turns out, there's a lot more to learn. Yes. I think that's good for all of you because there's plenty of work to be done. <laughs> um, okay, so do you have a favorite scientist? And if so, who and why? <laughs> It would be my advisor, Cynthia Che. <laughs> I second that one. <laughs> Cynthia's amazing. <laughs> I feel like now I have to say my advisor. Daryl Haggard is also amazing. Um, if, I hope anyone who's here can like meet her someday because she's just like super inspirational and like very down to earth and friendly. And she did a philosophy degree before switching to um, astrophysics. And like I did art as well as physics. So it's just like inspirational to see people like do disparate fields. I mean, I'm feeling a little bit of peer pressure here as well. I, certainly my advisor is excellent. I was gonna pick, uh, go for the star power route and say Jennifer Doudna, who's the uh, professor in biology who invented the CRISPR-Cas9 technique. Um, part like, for that work, but also just in general, her history of intense problem solving through experimentation is very cool. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> I hope you do meet her someday. Uh, maybe she's listening. <laughs> um, uh oh. <laughs> uh, okay, so here are a couple of questions about like the training it takes to become an astrophysicist. So, can you be an astrophysicist without a PhD? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, the whole everything is just a a process, right? Like the process of doing astrophysics isn't. Uh, like what, we all do different things and we all say we do astrophysics. Like I spend most of my time turning screws, honestly. Uh, and, but the, the most important part, I think, is the asking questions and then trying to find a way to answer them for yourself. And if those questions are related to astrophysics, then you're doing astrophysics when you do that. So um, anybody can, that's my stance. <laughs> yeah, I don't think any like, science, like job as a scientist requires a PhD. I mean, the famous example is Einstein. He was a patent clerk, so. That's true. Yeah, I'll just add like, I guess the caveat is if, if you're thinking about doing it um, in the traditional sense of like going and being like a professor or something like that, there can, like in academia, there can be more pressure to get a, like a PhD in astrophysics in order to like continue that, that academia route. Um, that said, I've also seen a lot of people, especially like younger people doing um, like masters in astronomy or astrophysics, and you can still do quite a lot with that. You can go in like um, computer science or data science. Um, we get a lot of training related to computers and coding just because of our jobs. So, uh, and you can still do astronomy with that training, even if you, if you don't have a full PhD. Yeah, and that's a good point about going to do other fields. We get a lot of people coming from other fields too. Like in my lab, we work with several professional engineers, like some of which have been engineers for a long time and are just, you know, 
sort of volunteering their time and others who have just finished an engineering PhD or an engineering bachelor's or something and they, they come in and, and do astrophysics with us. So we, there, there is a mix. Yeah, so on a, like in a similar vein, um, what jobs can you have as an astrophysicist outside of academia? Because, uh, Nicole, I think this picks up on something you <laughs> yeah, just mentioned. So. I might have already sort of answered that, um, but there are a lot of different jobs you can have, and I've actually thought about this extensively because I don't want to stay in academia, <laughs> even though I'm in pursuing a graduate degree. Um, so, like I mentioned, you can go into data science. There are places like Google and all of that stuff that are always looking for people trained in, um, like, yeah, coding and uh, data processing, especially big data. Um, Besides that, uh, one path I've been interested in is like going into climate science because a lot of the physics that we learn in our astrophysics training is also relevant for like modeling the Earth's atmosphere or um, even the atmospheres of other planets, all that stuff. So like um, you could do like planetary science as well, which is sort of like tan it's connected to astrophysics, but it's also its own thing. Um, and if you're interested in like combining other fields, I've also thought a lot about like science visualization and communication. Um, those are important skills that you learn as an astrophysicist, like how to convey your, your data. So you could uh, go that route, especially if you have any like art or graphic design training. Um, and you could do things like go into space law. There's a lot of different uh, fields that can be combined with astronomy, really. I would echo what you said about data science. So before I started a PhD in physics, I was like, what kind of jobs are out there for a PhD in physics? And I typed physics PhD into a bunch of the job search websites, and there's pages and pages and pages of people looking for data science uh, people. So Yeah, we have a lot of data. <laughs> Great. Um, OK, so we have another one. Um, I like this one. How has astrophysics and answering the big questions affected your personal philosophy towards life in general? That's a big question. Are we supposed to have an answer to that like on the spot? <laughs> I'll let you think about that <laughs> one. Because um, so this one's related, but maybe a little bit easier to answer. Uh, so it says many astronomers report a cognitive shift when observing slash researching. Has this been the case for you? I think at least for me, I tend to get kind of focused on the individual stuff I'm working on that day and trying to get working and don't oftentimes don't think about the larger implications of stuff like that. I'm just trying to get through what I'm trying to get through at the time. So I don't know. I think I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the huge picture stuff like that. I agree. That's also like maybe that's I don't exactly know what cognitive shift means for this, but like, yeah, it. As a grad student especially, you're always being given like so much work all the time that it's really easy to just get lost in like, like building stuff or doing coding, any of that. Um, the times where I actually have the easiest like take a step back and like appreciate what we're doing is um, when I do outreach and communication like with you guys um, because then I'm, I'm not just like in my little hole of research for the moment, but I'm actually like thinking about what I'm doing <laughs> from a larger perspective. <laughs> I think the, I don't know if I experienced like a particular shift or moment when I realized that I thought about things differently, but, or differently than I used to, but a sort of slow creeping process over the course of an undergrad and then master's degree had been that the more physics I studied, and I'm not gonna say the better I got at it, but just the more of it that I saw and the more time I spent doing it, I realized that I uh, like thinking about the way the world works, and now I have a increasingly solid framework to do so, and that has been soothing in a meditative sort of way, um, but also just a nice, I don't know, a pleasing way, I suppose, to have shifted my way of thinking into. Okay, so I'm gonna let you think about the big one for a few more minutes. Uh, mean, <laughs> in the meantime, um, there's a question for Nicole directly, uh, but anyone else can answer if you have, I think other people might have answers to this question. Um, so how do you merge arts and sciences? Oh my gosh, my favorite question. Um, <laughs> if you want, you can put my slide up again just so people can look at the thing I painted. <laughs> um, so I am always trying to find ways to do it, like I said in my bio. Um, the way that is easiest for me usually is to uh, find science visualization opportunities. So if people like are directly trying to convey a science concept, I will happily offer to create an illustration for them of that concept so that people can 
learn about it in a visual way rather than just hearing words describing something. Um, so that's like the, the easiest way. But honestly, I don't know. I feel like art just comes into my research like all the time. I'm always like sketching out my ideas and um, just trying, yeah, trying to make it a visual process. And even like when I process data and I'm like trying to plot it in a particular way, just the graphic design of how I do that is really like influenced by my art background. Um, so it, yeah, it really just comes in all the time. I think I might take advantage of the fact that I know you and I know your work to ask you a bit of a follow-up question. Do you want to tell people about the aliens project you had to do? Oh yeah. Because yeah. I think that's super cool. Yeah, so when I was a when I was an undergrad and I was a double major in uh, art and astrophysics, we I was in an art class where we had an assignment to create 100 objects. Anything just had to be 100 things and we had a week to do it. And so that's a lot of stuff to produce for one person. And so uh, the project I ended up doing was um, I came up with 100 different aliens and 100 different planets for them to live on. And I made trading cards for the planets and I built all the aliens out of um, clay. And they're all like pretty tiny. They're just like, like the size of a coin because I only had a week. <laughs> but um, yeah, so just another, yeah, I definitely did a lot of art projects in school that were also um, space themed. <laughs> Do you wanna talk about how that one has influenced outreach? Yeah, we just had, I don't know if anyone was here earlier today, but we, we've been doing Space Week events, um, and so we had a booth today where we let kids also do this exact same project. They came up with aliens and what kind of planets they'd live on, and they came up with some crazy stuff. Someone had like a alien that lives in a swamp and only communicates with antennas. So it's really fantastic <laughs> to see people get creative. <laughs> yeah, if anyone wants, we, we're going to post those on social media. There are a couple up now, but uh, we will be posting all of them if anyone wants to see them. They're very cool. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have thoughts about arts and science? I was going to give Nicole another shout out for another project that I know you've done <laughs> that I thought uh, that I just learned about and thought was really cool. And uh, as I guess it's somewhat artsy, but also just an interesting way to represent things in a uh, a less visual representation of physics. Like uh, we spend a lot of time looking at computer screens, which requires us to you know see what's on the computer screen, uh, and it's I could imagine would be challenging to do this kind of work if you couldn't uh, use visual cues of any kind. And so this very cool thing that Nicole's done uh, is to 3D print luminosity maps of uh, interesting astrophysical regions, like the center of our galaxy, where the uh, where they're embossed higher or lower depending on how bright that region is and so you can touch it and you can feel the texture and the shape of the galaxy and see where the stars are and where the gas is and you should probably explain it better than I can. No, that was a great explanation. Carolina also is the one that helped um, find these objects for us to print. But yeah, it's a really great um, tool and hopefully maybe we can post some pictures of those on social media as well. Uh, yeah, so this is a project called Tactile Universe because I do want to shout out the person who actually made it. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter. Um, no, it's, it's super cool. I mean, uh, but yeah, there's so many good ones and they're all open access. So we will post a link to that in our, in the description of the video. So if, if anyone wants to see. That's even better than I thought. I didn't realize it was an open source thing. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, there's many, there's many different galaxies you can print out. If anyone has access to 3D printers, it's a fun option. We had been looking for an excuse to print them and this is the perfect one. So now we have some of them. <laughs> um, okay, so switching gears a little bit to something more fun. Well, not, not that this isn't fun. Um, so uh, what kinds of pop culture depictions of space frustrated you with their inaccuracies? Do any of them get it right? I know this is a big thing with astrophysicists, so. Uh, yes, <laughs> I think it's the answer to both of those questions. Um, often, I, um, often portraying things in many aspects of, of pop culture as they are, like of life or anything just as it truly is as we uh, experience it isn't always that interesting. And so a lot of pop culture things will take liberties in one direction or another. But often I find that it's like, especially in more modern sci-fi, I guess, there's like they'll get specific things really right. Uh, I think of the first example that comes to mind is this like one really short scene in The Expanse, which in general I think is pretty good for the... Uh, science portrayal of things, but there's this one great scene where a, a person, one of the characters is on a, in, in an environment that has a reduced gravity, and there is a bird outside his window, and the bird uh, sort of like 
I'm going to try to do this with the microphone, like flaps and sort of like gently things, and then like flaps again, and it's just a little sparrow. And so when you see that on Earth, like they'd have to really be flapping fast in order to stay in one position, and there it's just like one slow motion, and it's like just a, and it's like maybe a two second shot, and then it doesn't pay any more attention to it. But I thought that was like subtle and good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could have no end of examples of movies that have stupid depictions of science in it. I mean, there's famous examples like. I don't know, Armageddon, or like, you know, where oh my God. Like, like there's an entire like two hour YouTube video going over problems with that movie or, so I don't, but I mean, at the same time, they're trying to appeal to a wide audience and it's just kind of a fun blockbuster, so. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say one example that I think was done really well is um, if anyone's seen Interstellar, they actually hired a consultant to uh, help them convey science accurately. It was uh, Kip Thorne and they depicted this huge black hole card called Gargantua in the movie and the way they depicted it is actually like super realistic with like the way light is bent around it due to the effects of general relativity. So um, that was also very visual, very beautiful to look at, um, but they did a very good, accurate job of that. I remember there was a lot of press around that depiction of the black hole. Yeah. Um, yeah. I might want to add one there too. This is Prometheus, oh. but just to see what people's faces are when you say that. <laughs> um, okay, Wait, so. We have to give the Alien franchise a little bit of credit because they are the ones that came up with the in space, no one can hear you scream, which is true. Yeah. <laughs> I know, Alien is fine. It's Prometheus I have a problem with. Um, <laughs> so um, we have a question that is directed at McLean, but I think Larry can answer as well. So I wanna hear from both of you on this one because you're both instrumentalists. So does the job of an astrophysicist also include designing prototypes, like using your creativity to design instruments and to develop newer technology? I know this is what both of you do. So. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> um, so for one of the fun things about what uh, all of us do is that we're trying to answer questions that obviously haven't been answered, but also sometimes that we need to build or new things in order to answer. Um, so this is a fun thing right now in astronomy because as technology moves forward, it opens up new doors to new things we can do with it, uh, which then lets us you know, see new things uh, or detect new gravitational waves or other signatures. And so, uh, I, yeah, I spend all my time thinking of <laughs> ways to build new instruments to uh, enable the science that we, as a collaboration, want to do. Yeah, I think, I don't know if I turned on my mic. No, no, did you press a button? I did. We were oh. supposed to press a button. <laughs> <laughs> do you want mic? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think uh, pretty much any experiment or project that you jump onto is gonna require you to make or build something new. Um, it's just part of the nature of, of uh, doing science work. Um, an example for what I'm personally involved in is the drone work that we're doing. Um, I mean, just, it's only just recently that it was possible to build these kind of things and, um, and fly them for, like, for just regular sort of, sort of people without being a big company. Um, so stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think it just building stuff is part of the process. I guess adding to that too, that uh, <laughs> the prototype thing stage, like we think about, you know, designing a whole new experiment from scratch, but it, you have to have a few trial runs at this. Like first you design it on paper and then you design it in code and then you design a very small version of it to test because that's cheaper, <laughs> but also you don't want to invest um, many years of your time on something and then find out, you know, that you've gotten the wrong screw size or something. <laughs> so the like physically building smaller versions of everything that we do is a very fun and rewarding part of the job. <laughs> Nicole, do you have anything to add or oh. not really? Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't really build things. I guess for an observational astronomer, we have to like propose why our science deserves to be on like used by certain telescopes. And sometimes we have to say like, we actually don't have any telescopes that can do the thing we want to do. So we, we are consulted when they're like designing new telescopes, for example, just to make sure that the telescopes do what scientists need them to do. Um, cool. Uh, so following up a bit on that, uh, since you mentioned observation, what kind of observations do you do? Oh, um, that can be for all of you. Yeah. Well, okay, <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go first, but then maybe you guys can also. Um, yeah, so I, technically, I usually observe in the um, optical part of the spectrum, so that's like stuff that we can see with our eyes. Um, but I mean, really, 
uh, telescope observations span the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So we could be doing like ultraviolet observations and uh, we learn something different depending on what um, wavelength range we're actually looking at. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to observing in multiple parts of the spectrum <laughs> going forward. Um, oh, and I guess, yeah, I, I think I already previously talked a bit that I, I observe um, black hole and neutron star mergers. So, so that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the explosions that come from those big things merging together. Um, yeah. Does anyone else want to jump in? Uh, for the experiments that I work on, it's really long wavelength radio observations, um, like targeting down below 30 megahertz or so. So really the observations that, I, <laughs> that my uh, research stuff makes is really radio observations. I think on the, uh, my observing on the day-to-day -day anyway is, tends to be when testing new uh, prototypes for, <laughs> for our upcoming telescope is a lot of um, like simplified schematics of has this detector that I'm building a circuit to, to get the signals out of seen light? Has this other one? Can I put them together to, to know that there's an object <laughs> that's shining on them? So it's a, a slimmed down version perhaps of <laughs> what you guys do. <laughs> Good, so we've already talked a bit about like building, a bit about observing, so we have a question here. Um, what do you spend the most time on? So trying to get funding, experimentation, writing papers, anything else, classes? Programming? <laughs> Honestly, 95% of my time is Python. <laughs> I spend a lot of time physically building things, whether it's stuff for um, the Albatross experiment, antennas, back-end uh, electronics, things like that, or the drone. Um, a lot of time I'm physically working on building something. I'm also in the programming camp. It's like, yeah, 95% of my time is just coding in Python um, or thinking about how to code things in Python. <laughs> Hmm. So this is kind of going in the same vein. Uh, could you take us through a typical day in the lab or in the field? I think you're all in the lab or at the computer in Nicole's case, so uh, who wants to go first? Um, I could go. Uh, so it depends on like my, my graduate experience so far has been um, mostly going to classes and uh, the class that actually McLean and I just took is um, radiative processes, which is uh, modeling how light gets emitted in astrophysical contexts and how it like moves through material in space. We are very important for <laughs> understanding astrophysics. Um, so yeah, as a, like an early grad student, a lot of your time is just spent on taking classes and getting like fundamental training so that you can do research well um, later on. But if I'm not working on homework or preparing for an exam, um, I'm yeah usually with my laptop and coding to process data that we've collected from telescopes or, or coding to prepare for data that's gonna be collected from telescopes um, or maybe writing something because we still have to write stuff even though we're like mainly doing physics and um, you know data processing. We, we do like I think Carolina said, sometimes have to apply for grants or write papers about the work we've done. Um, so that's also a thing, yeah. Um, so my life revolves sort of around a, uh, semi like two or three weekly cycle uh, to do with the testing of the cryogenic systems that I work on. So I guess that's probably more interesting to talk about than a day-to-day -day because depending on where I am in that cryogenic cycle, uh, <laughs> depending on what I'm doing during the day it varies a lot. Um, so the, the cryogenic systems we use to cool things down take several days to get cold because they get extremely cold uh, down to a fraction of a degree above absolute zero. And uh, that whole process of just the cooling takes two to three days, and so then there's the warming up. <laughs> it takes a long time too. You wanna to do testing while you're cold, and then once you are warm is when you can actually install stuff and make changes to your system. So uh, if I'm on a warm day, for example, or on a warm week, uh, you know, my cry do you have the picture of the cryo, uh, the slag? There's a, yeah, it's, so that's the system um, that is labeled lab work. That's when it's open. <laughs> <laughs> this is a view like up inside this giant can, which you see me standing next to in another one of those pictures for scale. Uh, and so I spend my time turning screws, installing objects in there, you know, attaching things with wires, building stuff with a soldering iron. Um, and then I close it all up and take all the air out of it and cool it way down. So those days are spent actually turning more screws and, and pushing buttons, and then I wait, um, and then it's cold, and I take data, and I do Python for like many days. Um, <laughs> and then it warms back up, and it repeats. 
Can you do an interpretation of the noise that the cryo... Oh, uh, yeah, so the main, <laughs> the main cooling element in there is called a pulse tube cooler, which pulses helium uh, to cool the main element in the fridge down to 4 Kelvin, or minus 269 Celsius. Uh, and it, it has this um, 1.4 times per second, precisely, it does a little like, doo -doo, doo -doo, which is constant in the background of the lab. You like kind of dance sometimes. <laughs> It's also been on the background of a lot of Zoom calls. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually helpful because I just have to unmute and then people know I want to speak. And so <laughs> it's very useful. <laughs> so I would echo what Nicole said, where if I'm taking a class that semester, then that can easily take up um, a lot of time. Um, but otherwise, it's some combination of being in the lab, um, r r lately working mostly on um, our drone work and kind of alternating between that and group meetings, whether they're in person or in Zoom. And, um, and the drone in particular has been, has taken up a lot of time recently um, because as you can imagine, um, the airspace in a place like Montreal um, is pretty complicated and not super easy to, for, for the aviation governing body to let you fly around in um, kind of when you want to. But there is a way, it's just time consuming, so I've been working on that lately. Uh, so we have another question that I think this is a fun one. Um, so can you tell us about an astrophysics task that almost seems false? false? Like something that is so weird that people wouldn't believe you actually have to do it. I think that's the intention behind the question. I mean, I, I feel like I do a fair number of weird things. Uh, oh, okay, so great one. Also has good uh, <laughs> names of equipment. So the, um, I do a lot of hands-on work <laughs> with telescopes. Most of my time is spent um, up in the north doing um, like small cryogenic testing. When you are on site at many telescopes that move specifically, you, one of your duties is to keep them in like physical maintenance, like the, the structure needs to be maintained, they rust, they wear down, that kind of thing. And so you <laughs> have to grease them. And so there are, uh, for the South Pole Telescope in particular, which is the one I'm familiar with greasing, there are two main el grease elements. There is um, large gears that you sort of, you know, <laughs> hold your breath and if like turn it off first and then stop it moving and like reach your arm way in there with the grease and try to, in these giant gears, which is terrifying. Um, the other <laughs> part, other thing that needs greasing is when you take a grease gun, which is like a big caulking gun, but that is extremely slippery, and then you put on the shirt that you care the least about, and you climb up inside the telescope, and you put the grease gun on the grease nipple, and you inject the grease into the telescope, and it's very personal. <laughs> I don't like the words you These use. These are real that. terms. These are real terms. I apologize. Did you say grease nipple? I did. <laughs> Not with a D on the end, just just grease. Just yeah. grease. Yeah. Okay. I will say that reminds me, I've been inside the so big telescopes have like a, a thing that supports them so they can rotate around and um, you can sometimes climb inside that thing that supports them. And at least the one that I've been inside of is just filled with dead moths. Like it's like a whole layer just along the entire bottom because basically they all fall in through the top of the telescope and then they're just um, stuck. <laughs> so I don't recommend climbing inside the thing that supports big telescopes. <laughs> Thankfully, we don't have that problem at the South Pole. <laughs> there are no moths. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a question about what it's like to be a grad student. Um, so are there any older grad students doing their master's or their PhD in their 40s at McGill? Uh, this is from someone who's thinking of pursuing an astrophysics degree but worries because that they'll stick out because of their age. So I am old. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not 40, I'm 38. But uh, I'm probably one of the older students um, here in the in the astro department. Yeah, I think there are, I can think of a couple of grad students who are, who are sort of uh, maybe older than you as well. It definitely, like they're definitely the age group is clustered younger. <laughs> um, I'm a, a couple years older than average, I guess. Um, and it, I don't know, I guess it can be odd at first when you don't know anybody and you just feel like, oh, I'm behind. But on the other hand, like, everybody's there because we love what we're doing and the community, at least, I have not felt that different from my peers. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. I haven't, like, felt different than any other student. And like you said, everyone's here because we want to be here. And, um, yeah, no, it hasn't been a problem. It's the only thing, and I wouldn't even call it a problem, that was a little bit 
difficult was going back into a classroom after being out of one for like over 12 years. But oh my god, undergrad was rough, yeah. honestly. <laughs> but like definitely worth it if it's something you're interested in. I think you like you should definitely. At yeah, any no, time. It, it's not like a mountain that you can't climb. So. Okay, so if you could change one thing about the field, what would it be? Um, make it more accessible, please. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, I think it's a struggle for a lot of STEM fields that typically have been, um, like, white male dominated, but physics has especially had problems with this, and so just finding ways to make the field more accessible is, I think, a huge, um, important task that is starting to be addressed now just by, like, having more role models that look different and so people feel more inspired to stay in the field or, um, you know, telling people that they actually can do it instead of just like, oh, you're a woman, why are you trying to do math? Or something like that, you know. I've heard all of that stuff before. Um, so, and even just, you know, making it more accessible for people that, like, might not be able to come into a classroom in the typical way um, or just, yeah, converting your learning materials for physics, like, labs to be easier to do from home, things like that. Um, yeah, for sure would be very, very useful. And especially for doing science, having more brains involved is always helpful for coming up with new ideas. But even without that motivation, we should always just want to let anyone do physics or science. There should be no obstacles to, to doing that. Um, yeah, definitely seconded, especially on the sort of um, people coming from all sorts of different backgrounds. I think it's a valuable contribution. I'm probably biased because I'm like, oh, well, I used to have a different job before I <laughs> was in physics, but I'm happy that I had that other job. However, having that other job made it pretty hard to get into physics because, you know, uh, in terms of just like practically speaking, I, I mean, I'm per like physically able in every sense of the term, but uh, having slightly lower grades or being busy working another job meant that I was ineligible for funding. I was ineligible, ineligible for most research opportunities and like there's just no... Uh, that's a hard, can be a hard thing to get around, and I would imagine we might miss out on a lot of motivated people <laughs> who are willing to, to, to participate for many reasons, like physical accessibility, uh, financial accessibility, cultural inaccessibility, like all that. I think a lot of people would say they change it by providing more funding for, for more projects. Those are all really good answers. Um, we have a couple of questions that are similar, so I'm going to try to ask them together. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on the rising wave of science deniers? Does it impact the way you do research or the way you communicate your science? Is it a, a is it a, do we think it, is it a rising wave or is it just that there are, it is maybe more vocal and has captured more attention because people in prominence have voiced it more? It I guess might be it the prominence of science denial. Yeah, prominence. Okay. I don't. Yeah, I guess I don't know whether I think that there are more people who think that way. Certainly, there are louder people who think that way. Um, I don't know. I have. I like a good argument, but I'd rather have a good discussion. And so, uh, <laughs> like, if I'm happy to have differing opinions from somebody on something and to talk to them at length, if somebody wants to be very uh, closed-minded, I guess myself included, that just doesn't con <laughs> doesn't really can doesn't lead to a good discussion. Um, so I guess that's a roundabout way of saying that <laughs> discussion is good, but closed-mindedness in any sense is, is not good. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, I don't think I've seen too much of it in the sorts of things that I look at. I mean, I don't think a lot of people are denying radio waves or things like that. But So thankfully, I think, the, at least for the stuff that I look at, it's been kind of insulated from that. Uh, I, I guess like the second part of the question there is what I'm maybe going to push all of you a bit on it. Does it change the way that you communicate your science or the way you explain your science to people, knowing that there might be some pushback in that sense? I'm definitely motivated to try and m make it accessible because I don't want someone to like be closed-minded about a physics concept because they just feel like they don't understand it, so therefore it's like not true or something like that. So I'm definitely very motivated to try and communicate things in a way that is going to be understandable for someone that isn't at like had a bunch of background in this. Um, and I guess for stuff that's not physics, generally I just try to be patient with people um, and treat them as human beings, but, you know, sometimes that's hard. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'll agree. Um, that was one thing, actually, that was really fun about my past job, when, especially when I was, uh, like, getting towards the end of my undergraduate degree is bartending and talking to a lot of people 
of a huge variety of backgrounds and almost exclusively non-physicists. Uh, it was very fun to talk about physics in that context um, and, or just talk about science in general and hear what people thought and what people's views were, what people learned, you know, remembered from school or were interested in and get that, like, <laughs> just that dialogue going back and forth. And like, I certainly learned a lot of things that I hadn't heard of before and I gained a great uh, appreciation for starting, or just like talking about something that is a shared interest between two people regardless and then sort of going into science from there. That's a cool thing with physics, because you like, really, no matter what you're talking about, uh, if it's somewhat science-y, there is a cool physics thing that is related to it, and that's, that's fun. <laughs> I'm a, such a nerd, I hear myself. Wow, I really like physics, I guess. <laughs> I'm great at parties, I swear. <laughs> uh, so we have another question that has been asked a couple of times. So why is thaumaturgy, I hope I'm saying that correctly, which is, uh, in parentheses, fortune telling, quantum healing, et cetera, and astrology, for example, still prevalent in the age of science. If that's something any of you want to jump in and tackle. I have not heard of quantum healing before. I don't know what that is either. <laughs> but astrology, we've heard. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, astrology has been around for a really long time. And if you go back in history, most astronomers were also astrologers. Like that was, you know, we studied the heavens for. I will call them heaven. We call them studied the sky in order to predict what was going on in our our day to day lives. And for a lot, most of recorded history, that has been in the form of you know in placing uh, characters or personas into what we saw up there and trying to use that to understand our day to day life because that's how we relate to the world. We are you know social creatures and we react to other people. We try to predict what they're going to do. And so why not do the same thing with uh, the sky? I don't have a whole lot of problem with astrology. If you want, if you want to be interested in it, that's fine. <laughs> it's not particularly something I'm interested in pursuing, but yeah. Yeah, I know astronomers will frequently like cringe when someone says, "Oh, you do astrology instead of astronomy." But yeah, I also agree. I, I really don't have much of a problem with it. I feel like there's room for both. Um, they're just like different interpretations of the sky, I guess, and life. <laughs> yeah, I think the only aspect of some of like quantum healing sounds, I guess I don't know what it is, but it does sound, anytime somebody just puts quantum in front of a word, it's usually gimmicky. And I do have a problem with when people use pseudoscience to sell stuff to people. Yeah. That's not cool. Yeah, monetizing, not as good. That's not cool. Yeah. Good. Um, so we're coming to almost eight o'clock, so I'm mindful of the time. Um, and there are lots of questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them. However, I have the final three questions that I'm going to ask. Um, so first of all, I think this might generate a pen. <laughs> this might give you space to talk a bit more. So in your opinion, which objects should we research more? Yeah, all the things. <laughs> all, all of the them? Things, <laughs> all the things deserve more research. I mean, um, uh, our, even our own Earth deserves more research because, like, you know, NASA, for example, has huge um, programs just for studying our atmosphere. Very hard to understand. Um, but, but, yeah, looking outside of Earth, of course black holes need to be studied more. What the heck? No What's going there, on in like. there? We don't know. <laughs> we have an image of the outer perimeter of a black hole, but um, it's very mysterious. Uh, so, you know, however we can continue to study those and uh, get more... Uh, you know, testing general relativity, all of that stuff would be very, very helpful. It's kind of hard to give a single answer, especially it's, it's hard to nail it down to, you know, astrophysics and stuff too when there's good answers from, you know, medicine and things like that and lots of things that need to be studied and looked at deeper. So I, I don't know, it's hard to come up with a good answer to the question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could all just say the thing that we study, um, yeah. which would be, <laughs> I mean, uh, clearly, hopefully we all think that or else <laughs> <laughs> it might be time to find a new group to work in. Uh, yeah, I liked your, I agree with black holes. I don't particularly study them myself, but you got onto the, using them as a probe for larger physical frameworks like general relativity. And so here's where I plug my field, uh, where we look at the very early part of the universe. We can look at how uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics may or may not play nicely together. And that's a big goal in modern physics today. Yeah, unifying the forces, all of that. Yeah, so you've all said that there are so many things to research and probably not enough time. So 
What are some ways that amateur enthusiasts of astronomy can contribute to research? Lots of ways, yeah, and increasingly more ways. Pandemic's been really good for getting um, like online stuff going where you can participate in all sorts of projects. Um, I know there are a few like open source. Uh, the one I think of right now is called Galaxy Zoo, which has actually been going on for a little while where uh, it's, it's, what, it's training machine learning algorithms by, to identify galaxy types, and the public participates by uh, saying like, yes, this is this type of galaxy. You're helping to train uh, this important scientific tool. There's lots of things like that. Uh, yeah, you can always go out and um, buy a telescope if you're, you know, any, there's lots of different price ranges for telescopes, so you can get small ones for relatively inexpensive and, um, you know, always, like, look up at the night sky with them. Um, I think there are also programs where you can, like, monitor specific objects with your telescopes and then, like, report your data, um, so stuff like that. And if you want to do, like, more researchy stuff, you can always, um, you know, look around for professors who are doing research that interests you and just reach out and see if there's any um, stuff they need help with that you could do to just uh, get more experience with um, astronomy. Yeah, my mind went to the same place that you said, where just buy an amateur telescope and just kind of keep general interest going in the field. Or build one. I've recently learned that you can build a radio telescope um, with a can, coffee tin, <laughs> and a wire, um, and a way to digitize a signal, which is great. And you can use that for, well, admittedly, just with the coffee tin, you'll be able to see when the sun is up. Um, but if you put your coffee tin on a satellite TV dish, um, you can see pulsars, which are cool. Um, you can contribute to pulsar timing efforts. There's a, as I've discovered, a huge, vibrant online community of people who do this. Um, and you can map, you can discover dark matter for yourself by mapping the, the rotation curve of the Milky Way, all with a coffee tin and, like, a small dish. It's great. That's awesome. I want to do that. <laughs> Uh, Nicole, do you want to talk a bit about, we were displaying a citizen science project at the booth this week, right? Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, so there's like a whole bunch of, citizen science projects are online and usually they just involve um, uh, astronomy researchers putting their data up online for the collective general public to help identify and classify things. Um, and so we have one that we were using at our booth that is identifying um, fast radio bursts, which are these mysterious pulses of radio um, signal that we don't really know where they come from. Um, but we have to sift through a lot of data of like human-made noise because we emit a lot in the radio before we, we um, find actual signals. Uh, so yeah, so, so regular you know, people that haven't been trained can still do really, really, really good visual data processing. Humans are just really good at identifying patterns in data. So very helpful to have that. Yeah, we'll make sure to share the links to some of these in the description of the video and on our social media. So to, uh, we're at time, so to end on a lighter note, um, and I think I might know the answer to this question, but so two days ago, former astronauts were on th this very stage. Would you like to be one now? Well, sure. <laughs> Eric? Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I am probably a no because I have a fear of flying. So I like to be on the ground looking up at the sky. I don't want to be in the sky, at least not until we have ships like Star Trek. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> Which are a long ways off, I think. Great. Uh, so thank you all so much for the great answers. This was so much fun. And thank you all for coming and for joining us both in person and virtually. Uh, stay tuned for more events. We'll be trying to hold some more um, public lectures over the summer, but for now, please join me in like thanking our panelists for this great panel.